I intend for this to be the first of a series of videos on the nature of kata and how it is used in the martial arts. I tried to to do a, a piece on this several times and I wound up running very long and, and still not getting the job done. And I finally realized to do the subject justice that I was going to have to break this into pieces. So I apologize if uh, some of these pieces are a little bit uh, uh, slow, maybe not as exciting, but I promise you they're all important to the, the greater uh, lesson that I'm trying to, to give here. So first of all, what is kata? Um, there, there is uh, some ambiguity in this, in that when you write the word in Japanese, you can write it more than one way. And to make it even worse, the different ways have subtly different meanings. This is just so typical of Japanese, by the way. But in any case, um, one of them is refers to uh, some sort of a, a form, a template, a, a, uh, a, a mold, and uh, but it allows for some dynamic uh, dynamics, some uh, some uh, adjustment, some some um, some um, flexibility in in the the uh, the use of that. The other word is the same as the first one for the most part, but it adds to it the character for the earth which uh, seems to imply that we're going to take something like clay or, or concrete or stone and we're going to lay it into that, which means that it's set in stone to use the, the Western expression. So it's much more rigid. There is no room for flexibility. It's, it's, um, it's, it's fully defined and, and there is no flexibility. So which one is intended by your teacher when they use the term would depend on what they intend and on the art itself, some arts tend to use the one term over the other. This is made more complicated if you are studying uh, some arts, uh, say for example, Okinawan arts, in which the, the, uh, the, the instructors at some point in the history of the, of the art were maybe not uh, as, um, as literate and uh, they may have uh, not uh, attempted to identify that, that difference. They assumed that you knew what they meant. Some instructors will write out the words, uh, the name kata and stuff in using uh, kana, which are phonetic uh, symbols, rather than uh, using the kanji, which are the, the, the Chinese uh, characters that have been adapted for, for a Japanese language. And so the point of that is that you may only be getting a phonetic uh, rendering of the word and, and, and not understanding these subtle differences. So this only adds to the confusion of, of what this is all about. Uh, so you have to find out from your instructor which it is. And in many cases, I have found that instructors, if nobody asks, they often don't tell. Uh, not that uh, they're opposed to telling, but they sort of assume if you don't care, then they're not going to bother to explain it. Uh, there are some students who are focused entirely on competition or on physical development or something else, and uh, they're not asking these kinds of questions, so the instructor may assume that they just don't care to know, and this will not be part of their their body of knowledge as they move forward, uh, it, it happens. Um, but how do these things apply in the martial art? Well, let me step back a step and talk about when I was a, uh, a child, um, very early on, uh, I hung out with my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather was a blacksmith. I mean, a for real old time blacksmith. Think uh, sweaty, guy with burly arms pounding metal you know with a fire nearby okay that was my grandfather um my grandfather uh used to take me with him everywhere and uh, in the morning uh, he would drag me out of bed while it was still dark we would go down to his shop he would fire up 
the furnace and uh, uh, the, the fire and he would uh, start working and he said you had to earn your breakfast and so we would work there until sunrise and then we would go and have breakfast. Um, now in his shop uh, I was poking around, getting in the way, and I remember seeing a variety of things. Among them were some metal um, uh, squares or pieces or shapes, and uh, and I asked him what they were, and he said those are those are forms. And uh, what would he use them for? And so, old time blacksmiths before there was the theory of replaceable parts and mass production, they made everything by hand. And so if, if someone came back to them and said, you know, that plow you, you sold me, the uh, this piece broke off, can you fix it? Well, then he would pull out the form that he used to build it, and he would make the replacement piece to fit the form. So he would pound it out and shape it and whatever he did, and then he would lay this thing on top of it to see if it fit. And if it was too big, he would cut it down. If it was too small, he'd pound it out or reheat it or start all over again, but it had to fit the form. And so uh, when I first heard in martial arts, the use of the word form, it made every bit of sense to me because I'd seen and held forms in my, in my hands and in my grandfather's shop. And it really defines what they are. They, they define the, the, the correct piece and there is a system in, in place there, laying it over and measuring and doing whatever you do to ensure that that the form is met, that uh, you have, there's some sort of diagnostic process which allows you to know that yes, this fits the form, it is correct. And, um, and then there's a way to correct it, of course, as well. So that was the form. So this, this made sense to me. <clears throat> and then when I was training with my Japanese instructors, I uh, remember one in particular, uh, I would just beat my brains out and do things thousands of times trying to get something right. And, um, and, and, and if, I, if I got it right, all I ever got was, hmm, hmm. There was just a sort of, hmm. There was this grunt and a nod, and, and then we went on to the next thing. No attaboys, no good job, none of that kind of stuff. I was golden if all I got was a, mm, that meant that was it, okay. When I got it wrong, uh, I got a lot more reaction. Um, and I would hear often, chigaimas, chigaimas. And remember my instructors were people that were born uh, over a hundred years ago, um, more like 120 or 130 years ago. So we're talking about old style Japanese uh, and Okinawans who had, and Japanese who had, you know, had actual ties to the, to the warrior class, you know, the samurai class. I mean, you know, we're talking about old timers. And uh, they'd see chigaimas. And it, my point being is that I, I assumed it meant, initially I assumed it meant, well, that's wrong, you know, not nah, wrong, you know, or somewhat something like that. And at some point I remember asking, so that means wrong. And, and they, uh, this one teacher told me, not exactly. I mean, if you look up the word chigaimas in a Japanese dictionary, it will probably today say uh, it's wrong or to be wrong, right? It's a verb, it's to be wrong and uh, or to be an error or whatever. Uh, but he said, that's not really what it means. If you look at the origins of the word and its etymology and all that sort of thing. He said, it really means that here's the correct way Here's the kata, here's the, the standard, and this doesn't fit. So it was like my grandfather laying the, the form over the piece, and it doesn't fit. That's chigai mas. <clears throat> this is a, an important distinction, because it doesn't mean it was wrong <clears throat> in the normal sense. It doesn't mean that this couldn't even be at some point useful or have some application or something. But it is not what I'm teaching you. It is not the standard form, which is what's being carried forward in this, this martial art. We sometimes hear people make statements, especially in karate, where they'll say, well, uh, karate is kata, kata is karate, right? What the heck does that mean? I mean, those are really cool statements to make. It sounds like you know a whole lot. What does it mean? 
I, I get a little bit frustrated sometimes with people who who are are overly uh, uh, they they make things complicated and sound erudite, but it's really these are very simple concepts, and and we ought to be able to convey them. So what 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 the, what the heck does that mean? What it means is is that what makes karate karate is that there's this body of knowledge, this wealth of knowledge from masters who have fought in the real battlefield, have fought in real exchanges with other martial artists who are, 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 have been renowned for their expertise in the martial arts. And they're trying to pass on what they know to subsequent generations so it won't be lost. And how do you do that? You do that by constructing kata. You don't, you can't put up a video cam. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't do an audio tape. Uh, writing this stuff is very difficult. You'll never get rhythm and movement and distance properly. Trying to sketch it out on a pad, you, you can't do that. So how do you pass it on? And the kata is the way that you can pass this on. You're taking a body of knowledge. You're taking the experience, the real experience and the expertise developed by some master or masters, and you are passing that forward through time. So that's a that's a very uh, in, important thing to to want to be able to 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 carry forward. And you may go beyond that. In fact, if you get far enough along in the martial art, you're going to be expected to go beyond that. The, the purpose is not to stop where the last guy stopped. That would just be silly. But before you can push forward, you need to know the starting and you need to first learn what they have to offer or you're not doing karate, you see. Now, what, what are they trying to teach you? So you learn that body of knowledge. So you have to not only learn these individual elements, but you need to know how they fit in with one another and how they, they you have to know the rei, how, how, um, how all the different things you could do follow the same set of principles. It's very, it would be very hard if you memorized hundreds of, uh, you know, two-man sets for this guy punches, this guy blocks, and blah, blah, blah. And you learn hundreds of those. How, how would you use that in a, in a match or in, a, in, a, in the battlefield? I mean, you know, you'd have to like sort through which one am I supposed to use for this one? And you somehow pull it up and, and apply it and hope the other guy doesn't know that little routine because if he does, you're screwed. Uh, that, that would make no sense. What you're trying to learn are underlying principles that guide you, habits that you're going to make. Habits make you look really smart uh, because when the guy moves a certain way, you always sort of fade out and he misses you and think, wow, it was great that he was able to know. It's a habit. This is the muscle memory we're all shooting for, right? So you're trying to develop all of these, these skills and, uh, and, and have those uh, as, as, as a way to respond in a natural way, uh, this is part of what made Kano's people so so effective in uh, the the contest that his students fought in was that he was able to draw back into those concepts and bring those those approaches forward so that people were responding naturally and effectively. Uh, but that's that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to to pass that information forward, and so the the kata is is probably more than you think it is. So the, the kata there, you usually see a demonstration form. And some people think that's it, that's the kata. No, uh, not the way I was taught. I mean, I've heard it referred to that way and I've heard people you know, think of it that way. Uh, but I was told basically the kata is an entire instructional program. And there's gonna be a, a centerpiece uh, application, which is the the uh, demonstration form. And sometimes there's more than one, which makes you wonder, right? There's more than one. Um, and, and Kano and Judo even makes this very explicit in which he gives you two, two halves of the uh, Koshika no Kata. There's an Omote form and an Ura form. And the Omote form is the, 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 the obvious. This is the in your face. This is the, uh, the detail being laid out and uh, 
you know, you might think that's the whole thing, but then he actually shows you, here's the, um, here's the aura form, which is the, the underbelly. This is the, this is the real application, you know, and he actually presents both to you to, to, to learn and to, to practice. Uh, but in fact, there's a namote and an aura in every kata, if you know what you're looking for, right? Um, so you have a lot of depth in the demonstration form, but then you have what some people call a bunkai, an oyo. These are the two terms you hear a lot of, especially in karate. Well, what is, what is that stuff, you know? Uh, well, in order to fully understand something, you have to engage in both uh, analysis and synthesis. Analysis, which is the, the, the bunkai, uh, it, if you look at the origins of the word in English, which is the same as in Japanese, it refers to breaking it down, to tearing it apart, looking at the elements. It's, it, the analysis means breaking it into the pieces, into the components, and understanding the components, right? Uh, so that's what analysis is. And then, of course, you do the oyo, which is the application. You try, you try to apply all these these ideas and principles and things. You know, you you couldn't possibly put everything you could possibly do in fighting in one form, but yet you hear people say that that each form was originally a fighting art. Well, how, how can you be, have it both ways? You know, I mean, if I've only got you know uh, fifty four movements or twenty seven movements or thirteen movements, uh, the most commonly practiced kata in, in Okinawa is seisan, which means 13. <laughs> so if that's, if you only have that short of a form, how could it possibly have everything? In? It doesn't, it has a lot of, a lot of um, concepts and approaches and lots of skills and many, many things. If you learn that, then the rest, you know, you can, you can apply, you can apply this to all sorts of things. So, so it, it, it makes sense that, that you have to to learn what the underlying principles are and then break it down and then try to apply those in a variety of ways, which is the oyo. Then the final part is a synthesis, which synthesis in English and in Japanese refers to putting it back together. Now I know what I'm doing. I know why I'm doing it. I know how it's applied. And now I got to put it back together and I have to get into the form and start to experience that to learn from it. So these are very important steps. Now, what else are you trying to, to get from the kata? Well, I, I saw a, uh, I heard a lecture from a guy named Dennis Wadley, who is a psychologist, and he um, does sports psychology and other kind of things. And one of the things that he, he said that really rang true to me with my understanding of kata was that um, he said that uh, they've learned in modern uh, neuroscience that if you if you can uh, uh, if you can if you can visualize that's the term to use I was looking for the word if you can visualize something that if you can very carefully visualize it repeatedly your body uh, and your mind has a tough time separating that from real experiences okay so this is really important that you visualize it if you if you if you visualize being in this this combative situation and and moving from person to person and throwing and striking and kicking and doing all the things you do that as you go through that your your body actually learns from that as if it were a real experience now nobody's saying that it's identically the same i mean that it's as good but it it goes a long way to giving that experience now to the greater degree that you actually perform this as part of the visualization, it becomes even more tactile. It becomes more real to you. And so in a very real way, you are able to experience what that master experienced when they, when they perform the kata, when they, when they are, were in the original battles or in the original conflicts, which led to it. Now, I'm not saying that every kata is a reenactment of a, of a battle or something. Um, no, there are many kata, there are many different kinds of kata, and some of them are actually very carefully constructed uh, to, to teach certain kind of things, but they draw on the experience and the approach and the methods and all the other things associated with the master who put it together. 
So in a very real way, it's going to feel a lot like the way they perform. You're getting to basically not only see the guy out there in front of you doing it, somebody who might have been dead for 100 or 200 or more years, but you're able to actually take their role and mimic it, which is really profound. So if they tend to have a certain broken rhythm, a certain you're going to have it too. So that you're going to be drawing on their experience and and their way of doing it as you perform. Now, there are some kata that I think pretty clearly reflect either a battle or a collection of experiences from the uh, from the master who developed it. They might have had two or three different experiences that they draw and they say, I'm going to put those together and it'll be like one long form. So they do that. But when you when you go through this, you get to feel what it was, what it would be like to be that master. How does he move? How does he think? How does he react to his opponent? What happens when he makes a mistake? What happens if he does something right, but his opponent manages to block it or to the sidestep or whatever it is? How did he recover from that? Uh, you're able to experience all that as if you were the master. So for a few minutes, you get to feel what it's like to be a master. How cool is that? You know, just when to jump up in the air, you know, just when to turn around. Just when to block and make the punch, just when to slip things by, just when your arm's going to get twisted and you have to turn and break through. I mean, you, you're 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 able to experience all that, and in the sense of this psychologist, you, you're actually able to to experience it, and your body will have trouble differentiating, and your mind will have trouble differentiating between that that it being a real experience and a learned experience. So this implies there's a really important thing to do in kata. Now, it, it, you know, you go, you may say, well, I don't want to do kata. That's 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 a fixed practice. It's not dynamic. It's not real. Blah blah blah. I just want to kick a bunch of stuff. But then you will never know what it's like to have been a real master who's really fought on the battlefield, who really knows how to hit every point dead on, because you'll see combinations of things in kata that you think. I would probably never do that in a match. I would never have thought to do that in a match. That's so complex and so convoluted. But that person did. And there was clearly something going on there. And you have so much to learn by mastering what it is they are they are talking about doing. So this this also leads to this whole concept of passing on the art intact. Um, there's a concept in martial art called shuhari, uh, and this is uh, three words. Shuhari, shu means to to imitate. Uh, and when you're first learning, you, you're supposed to just copy whatever your teacher does. You want to show your teacher, I can do it exactly the way you presented it to me. That means you've gotten the lesson from the history and the lineage of the art. Okay, that's the first step. Can I pass this on to the student? Now, if you don't make that effort, if you don't master that, if you don't, if you don't show that you can do that, then there's really no reason to go forward. And you will see instructors who will just, he's going to be a good competitor. That's fine. Let him go off and do his thing. But I'm not going to really waste time trying to teach him advanced kata because he doesn't care. Okay, he doesn't. He doesn't think it's of value, and so they just. They basically walk away from. Him. They don't. They don't say anything bad to them. Usually, they don't. Usually, there's no, no, no animosity. It's just that well, you know, there's going to be students who are going to do that. One of my teachers said, "Well, you know, every dojo needs its fighters. Everyone, every dojo needs its teachers. You know, we need all these things. You know, and that person's not going to. We're not going to bother with that. So you first have to show that you can actually do exactly what your instructor does." And your instructor knows what's important and is using all of these diagnostics and tests that are built in the kata to make sure that you are dead on with this sort of thing, right? And then the next step, which is like third, fourth, fifth down, somewhere up in there, you start to diverge. Shu ha. This is the, it's just starting to break off. Now you can ask questions. And nobody says, oh, shut up. It's not like that. But you'll ask questions and you'll sort of get blown off and you'll feel like, well, maybe there's, there's no answer. Maybe that, you know, whatever. I mean, they, they, they find ways to to not answer. Japanese are very polite. But 
but you you just don't really ever get a good answer. Then in the second stage, you start asking questions and you start getting answers. And they're very carefully shaping you. So when you say, well, why couldn't I do this? Well, maybe you could, but you'd have to do this, this, and this, and you'd have to be consistent with this and this. You don't want to learn, you know, a variety of different things um, when you could learn one. So for example, most of these traditional arts like uh, in Japan, uh, they included not only taijutsu, empty-handed arts, but they also included uh, a variety of weapons because they're training soldiers to be on the battlefield. So you'd learn the 18 weapons, uh, that's what they called it. And uh, if you were learning 18 weapons and every one of them had a different set of principles, you move in a different way, you work on a different everything, you'd never, you'd never figure it out. You'd be a confused mess, right? So this part of the RI is that all of these things have to operate under the same principles on the same tactics and strategies. It's all got to work the same way. So you have a, a, a very tightly defined uh, coalesced martial art so that when you're fighting, if a weapon comes by, you can grab it and pull it right into the fight and never miss a beat. If you lose your, your weapon, again, you don't even lose a beat. You keep moving. Now you're empty handed, but hey, you know, you're empty handed, whatever right? So you're able to pull this in and out constantly. So it's very, very important that you have this, this re-eye, this consistency, and your instructor is going to be saying, you, know, you could do that. You could try doing a boxer's roundhouse there, but what's that going to do to your distancing? What is that going to do to your rhythm? Uh, how's that going to open up your, your, uh, your body to attacks in different directions and so on? There's so many things to consider. So you're, you're learning how to do it correctly. And what you're doing is you're owning it. You're making it yours. This is how you you make that next step. You know, you're making it yours by learning what you can do, what you can't do, and and so very slowly you're headed toward the third stage, which is divergence. Now you're no longer confined by the art. You are the art. That's why we call the highest you know instructors. We call them hunchy. It means like a model. They they are the art. The art is them. They can't do it wrong because they are the art. And so by definition, they're doing it correctly. But everything they are adding, everything that is themselves, to they're adding to it, it is all, it has all been made consistent with the larger whole. And because of this, you'll see masters when they teach, they'll say, this is the kata as it was taught to me by this person who was taught to him by this person, or you know, this was the way it's performed by this, this, this master. And they, they talk about the lineage of the kata, or the lineage of the the waza, um, they're 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 one, of, and they'll tell you how it was reshaped by each one, and how each one did it slightly differently or whatever, but consistent with the the greater art. And so you are really starting to own this thing. This this becomes uh, becomes yours. Um, and this is a a, a very uh, important point to to passing on the art and mastering it. I get a little bit annoyed when I see uh, somebody typically young who maybe is a brown belt or a shodan or something, and they're going to go off and start their own art, or they're not going to listen to the teacher. They know better. Uh, I got to make this work for me, and uh, everything is relative. So, you know, that may be right for you. It's not right for me. I'm going to do it a different way. And, and uh, you know, they ignore all the lessons. Well, they've, they've lost a lot. Um, they don't know that this won't work for them because they really haven't given it the time and energy to make it work. Uh, they are already ready to run off on their own. They're full of ego. And that's just a, a very, very sad thing to see. Um, this, is, uh, this is a rich, uh, uh, rich means of passing on lots of information and uh, it's important not to lose sight of it. Now, in the, the Okinawan uh, martial arts, quite often these kata are done individually. One person gets out and performs, and uh, then they work with partners on the on the the other elements of it in this this larger instructional program. Um, in in grappling arts or other kinds of arts, um, there are sometimes you know multiple people out there, two or more. Uh, in the performance, 
And of course, the, the, the reason is it, it's harder to, to go through, especially grappling type maneuvers when you're doing them alone. So they, they do it in a, a two man routine. It's a kata, but it's, it's done another way. And that's what you see like in the Nagino kata in, in judo. Now I mentioned Nagino kata because that's one of the first ones that, that students run into in, in, in judo. Um, it is a randori no kata. So its focus is on randori waza, right? Randori techniques, as opposed to uh, defending against swords or something, right? Uh, now people are sometimes confused because it is it is about randori waza. Randori is like free sparring kind of a thing in judo. Um, and people are confused. Why, why would you, if it's for randori, it's got strikes and things in it. And uh, that... That's that we don't do that in Rondori. Well, we don't now. <laughs> of course, they, they did then. There are different kinds of, of Rondori that were done. And some of them involve strikes. Also, you're trying to, to show the student, you're trying to set up the student so they're put in an ideal situation to perform the technique. So that, again, they get to feel what it's like to be a master. And you've seen it. If you've ever done the kata, you'll get into certain points and the guy will fly and you'll think, whoa, that was amazing. I wish I could do that in Rondori. Um, you know, board matches, you know, and of course, that's what he's trying to show you is how to make that happen. There are also diagnostics built in. Uh, in the uh, in the judo uh, kata, for example, there are very specific things we look for, like there's an imbusan, a kata line, and did, did you throw the person right on the kata line? Or were they at 30 degrees off or this side 30? And depending on where they land and where they were supposed to land, the instructor should be able to glance at that at, at a glance. We've got a whole class of people doing this and go, this guy didn't turn in enough. This person turned too far. This one didn't get low enough. This one didn't do that. The pull on the left hand is wrong over here. And you, it, it diagnoses for you all of these issues. When, uh, when, when Kano would hear people in judo that they're, they were losing matches uh, in grappling, he would tell the seniors to take them off and run them through Katami no Kata again. And he would, he, today people think it was completely nuts. I mean, how could he possibly teach people to do mat work by having them do Katami no Kata over again? You know, that's a, that is a form of grappling. But of course, first of all, it reflects the kind of grappling they did at the time. But also, he's not talking about the demonstration form alone. He's talking about going through all of the, the, the major forms of of, uh, of holes and and their application, their entry and their escape and so on. It, this is a full program of instruction. There are a few model techniques which are presented, but that isn't all the techniques. That's just models. There's going to be a whole range of things that go go on from there, right? And so the 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 actual instructional program would include all of those those various uh, models. Now you'll see. Other things which you may not think of as kata, but just standing and doing punches can be kata, you know, in, in, in the broadest sense. There's a right way and a wrong way. And uh, you will see uh, masters uh, in Japan and Okinawa having a student doing a simple, I say simple, in construct, um, uh, like sanchin or something, or just standing and punching. And the, the instructor is walking around them and hitting their arms, hitting their body, hitting their back, their legs, and making sure that all the right muscles are tight and all the right muscles are not tight, that the balance is correct, that the, the, the alignment of the spine is correct, the position of the arm is correct if they're punching too much across or too much out or whatever. Um, they're, they're testing all these things. And that's what the kata does. It gives you this sense, system of diagnostics to ensure that the form is correct. So it is a teaching program. It is definitely a, an instructional program designed to, to give you these kinds of information. So there's a lot of diagnostic built in there as there should be. Otherwise, the, the kata is not much, much useful. If you're just going to go out and dance for a while, then you're not going to get much from it. And in fact, I, I did that on purpose is that I heard old timers talk about dancers. And what they meant was these are people who just, you know, just perform the kata 
with you know, empty without without being in the kata. They're just doing the demonstration form, and they look good, but they don't know what they're doing, and they're they're not very effective, and they haven't learned the lessons of kata and so on. They they're they're dancing. That's what that's the term they use. Is it derogatory? Well, sort of yes and sort of no. It's just sort of a factual explanation that they're they're out there moving around in a choreographed way. That's a dance, right? But they don't really know what the applications of, of what they are doing are, and so that's that's what what they're trying to focus. That the, the ideal is for you to get all of this this information and uh, to 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 be able to use that to build uh, a more effective martial art. Um, another analogy I can use for kata is, is uh, if if you own the military, uh, you know, in, into the, the army or the Marines, whatever, uh, they will uh, they'll put you through basic training, and the the instructor doesn't just say, well, you know, there's a punching bag, have that. There's a gun, go figure out how to learn it, how to use it. You know, you know, you don't learn everything from scratch. The person who's training you or the people who are training are people who have been there. They have done this. They have been on the battlefield. They have fired at, at real enemies. They, uh, they, they know what it's like often to get hit with, with uh, one of those bullets. And they'll be, they'll be putting you through experiences which are designed to help you feel what they feel, how they know to react. They want you to feel that way too so that you'll do the same thing. They don't just tell you when they start firing the machine guns, you better get on your belly and start crawling. They put you on your belly and get you crawling and show you how to do it to make sure that this is the way the guys did it who lived through this. People like me, they say, you know. And so it's it's invaluable to have this direct experience. And that's what these kata are doing in martial art. They're trying to take somebody who knows the drill, who knows how to do this and how to survive, and is trying to pass that information on to you so that you can be not just adequate, but a master. How do I get you from here to there? How do I get you from, you don't even know how to punch, to doing these kinds of, of effective things? I've heard people point to uh, somebody and say, oh, that guy knows how to kick. And what they're looking at is he stands there and he, he punches in the air, punches the bag. That's not really what we're talking about when we talk about somebody knows how to kick. To kick, you've got to be able to kick somebody. How do you break through their defense? How do you align yourself? How do you close? How do you do all the rest and manage to hit them and hit them in a way that's going to hurt them and put them out of commission? There's a lot more to kicking than just kicking up in the air and isn't that pretty. It's about all these other things. Uh, the same thing with, with throwing. How can I throw with power and, 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 and strength and precision? and control so that I can put the guy wherever I want. On the battlefield, I may want to throw the guy up the side of a tree. You know, I may want to do a lot of things, but I better be able to control him if I expect to do that. So there, there's a lot of a lot more depth to this than I think people want to give it credit for. And it's it's a little annoying to, to see people uh, take kata lightly. I think that's a good starting point. Uh, I'll go on from here in uh, a later video. I need to talk about a variety of things about the kinds of kata and how they're organized and how they're applied. I hope this is useful.